Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everybody. Welcome to New Books and Biography, a podcast channel of the New Books Network. I'm your host, Dan Moran, and I am thrilled to be here today with Richard Bradford, author of Tough Guy, The Life of Norman Mailer, just published in January 2023 by Bloomsbury Caravelle. Welcome, Richard. Hi, nice to be here. Great. So I, I love the book. I loved every page of it. And I, but I have to start with a big question. The question's a little long, but I have to get your, your overall take on this. Now, your book is not a work of um, hagiography. Mailer is portrayed as a philanderer, a drunk, um, someone who, who could be intellectually lazy, a loudmouth. Uh, he's a bully. He's physically abusive, sometimes to women. Um, we know the story. He stabbed his second wife. You talk about that in the book. But he's also portrayed as a writer with more misses than hits. Um, I just want to read you a few comments on some of his work. You say in his essay about the meaning of Western defense, you quote, I have no idea what this means, and nor I suspected Mailer. Um, when you talk about what he wrote for the Village Voice, you say, quote, as a satirist, he is embarrassing. Um, when you talk about his, his praise for Waiting for Godot, you say his praise matches the play in its incomprehensibility. His novel, Why Are We in Vietnam?, you call dreadful. Um, on his essay, his famous essay, The White Negro, you say, quote, the passages that do make sense are uniformly ghastly. You call his book, The Prisoner of Sex, intellectually stunted. Um, then you get into the later books you say about ancient evenings, quote, it's astonishing that anyone found it publishable, let alone readable. You say that his biography of Picasso is, quote, equal parts bad and revealing of Mailer's ignorance of the visual arts, and of his last book, The Castle in the Forest, you say, quote, he chose to write about Hitler because he had exhausted all other exhibitors of literary self-aggrandizement. Wow. So all of that said, right, why Norman Mailer? Um, well, before I get to the question without entirely avoiding it, um, I should comment on a couple of reviews that I've had in the national press in the UK. And... Um, most of them have been okay, and the ones who have put question marks before their uh, ooh, qualified approval have seemed to think that I'm some sort of biographer stroke hit man. One of them stated that I conducted a CIA style wet job, as they put it. Um, and at the same time, this was in a liberal newspaper, they conceded that. Uh, Mailer is, as I say he is, and he did what I say he did. And they seem to think, you know, well, why didn't you let him off? Um, but anyway, back to your question, why Norman Mailer? <laughs> he, really, I might give the impression that I, I loathe Norman Mailer and everything he has written. In truth, I don't. Uh, I think secretly I probably envy him. A little bit, <laughs> but I'm not letting it out. Um, but why did I write about him? Well, as uh, you probably recall, but I'll go through it here anyway. I begin the introduction with a um, uh, a sort of fictional hypothesis where there's an agent, a Manhattan agent, in his office trying to work out what he's going to say to one of his best, most um, popular writers, who has just submitted a novel on literary writing, the current state of the literary world, in which he portrays a male writer who is a psychopath, who deals with his um, reviewers, if they don't give him a particularly praiseworthy review, with a pickaxe handle. Uh, who is a prize-winning Lothario who beats his wives, um, who on one occasion uses a samurai sword at a party to seek revenge upon one of his literary rivals. Uh, if, he had, if he wasn't so drunk and full of drugs, he would have finished the job, but the ambulance arises so, too soon. Eventually, he's elected governor of New York State, uh, and among his policies are bear baiting in Central Park and uh, the legalising of po the public flogging of paedophiles. And the agent has read this novel, or uh, the, 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 the 
the script of this novel. And he gets onto his author and he said, it's exciting, but this is supposed to be a realist novel. No one is going to believe this. OK, we know it's fiction, but it has to be credible. And then he thinks, maybe I could sell it. And then he thinks, no, I can't. It's too close to the actual real story that is the life of Norman Mailer. So you can see why I made that up, because Norman Mailer's life is too bizarre for fiction. In many ways, as I also said, everyone, uh, I suppose most American writers of the 21st, 20th century and 21st century, um, the, the, the Holy Grail is the great American novel, so-called. I think the great American novel is the knife life of Norman Mailer, except that it's not a novel. So I'm not claiming to have written the great American novel, but the story of his life is quite astonishing. It is. It is astonishing. <laughs> I, and it, in your defense, I never thought it was a wet job at all. I mean, I, you know, you wouldn't. You'd have to be a kind of a miserable person to just want to devote your life to somebody, or devote all that time and work to somebody you loathe and whose work you all loathe and things like that. So I still, I always had the spirit that that you were you you were like you can't you can't look away from him. What you think about Norman Mailer? He's he's a, he is a force of nature. Yeah, exactly. Um, he's he's addictive in many ways. Even <laughs> yeah, he is. Even, even even though you feel uh, I can't I can't put up with this anymore, you find yourself grinning at not putting up with it anymore because he's. <laughs> I mean, you you feel ashamed about enjoying it when you read about him, but that's you can't, that's you can't spot on. It. <laughs> Absolutely. Let's let's talk about the title because there were times when I was reading it, I thought, and the cover image is terrific of him about to, you know, spar with the light bulb. Um, there are times I thought the title was ironic, like you know, sometimes his idea of being tough was to headbutt somebody or you know drink a whole bottle of bourbon before he gave a speech. Like, how did you decide on that title? Well, I confess, um, I, I I hope to give credit here to my Bloomsbury editor, Jane Jane Parsons. Um, we were talking about it, and I'd come up with other ideas. And she said, I mean, she's, she's a great uh, salesperson. She said, right, we've got to be snappy. We want two short monosyllables, which will also evoke uh, the name of a particular book that everyone will associate with Norman Mailer. So it was simple as that, tough guy. Right. Yeah, for tough guys don't dance, yeah. It's, it's, um, you know, it, ha- it, it has a sudden impact, if you like. Yes. So um, yes. credit to her. Great. Well, let's go, let's start going through his life as you do in the book. So, you know, we know he went to, we'll skip his early days, but he, he went to Harvard. He graduated in 1943. And you write about him there kind of reveling in this role as like a troublemaker. You call him a conspicuous outsider. Um, you say sometimes he might have bordered on being an adolescent self-publicist. And, and he loved this idea of an outsider his whole life. Like he would dress down at formal occasions. You know, what did he enjoy about his time at Harvard? What did he enjoy about that role? Uh, again, I, I, it, it's, in, it's impossible to um, read so far back and know exactly, even from accounts um, from people who were his peers and contemporaries at the time. Um, it, it, you, you, you can't really, you can't really mind read the, the you know, the, the condition of someone of that age in that period. But the, all I can say is that his. The way he behaved and the way he presented himself at Harvard, it seemed to prefigure his career as a writer, even though at the time uh, it wasn't certain, and he wasn't certain that he wanted to be a writer. But he certainly enjoyed being the person who was difficult to categorise. Um, yeah. He cultivated a kind of smirking unpredictability. He liked to... Um, dodge anything straightforward no one could really pin him down and in many ways you could see him enjoying this at harvard while you could look forward and see that this was going to be the norman mailer of uh the books that he wrote the norman mailer of the various personae that he adopted as the literary superstar and so on and so on um so yeah i i think that mailer at harvard was uh, the apprentice version of Mailer in his later years as a writer and a cultural superstar. 
Yeah, that's a great way to put it. The apprentice years, right? You say there that he, he that at Harvard he developed his credo of of and this is your quote wanting to write things that would upset people, <laughs> yeah. and that's where he figured that out. That's true, um, but I don't think he simply wished to cause offence. Um, he was a rebel. But he was also, at the same time, a mischievous egotist. He wanted to draw attention to himself by uh, annoying people. Um, (laughs) So, in a way, he didn't didn't want to upset people or offend people because he was uh, intrinsically malicious. He, He did it in all sorts of ways, without necessarily wanting to hurt them too much. But he, want, he wanted them to look at him and remember him and make sure he'd, he'd leave an impression on them. And again, that was Mailer later in his life as well. Yeah, that certainly had, that was the arc of his career, right? And you point out that, and also a thing that went from Harvard on, is that Mailer wanted to be kind of like both an insider and an outsider at the same time, right? So there's a part in the book, we'll talk about The Naked and the Dead in a few minutes, but there's a part where you talk about how he got the film rights for the, the were paid for the naked and the dead. He gets all this money, right? And and you say he's trying to be a Trotskyist, but at the same time he enjoyed having all this money, right? And you quote Diana Trilling as saying that he was a chameleon, and he would slip between these radical hipster personae and somebody who enjoyed very much being part of that social and cultural hierarchy, right? So was he what people would call like a Mercedes Marxist? Like how much of this was a pose? What do you think? Yeah. Um... Or the English version of that is the um, Bollinger Bolshevik. Um, yeah, I know what you mean. And I don't think it was a pose, really, in the sense that he wasn't so much putting it on as living an anomaly. I mean, because like so many people in Western countries, uh, in the States, probably less so now, and, and certainly in the UK, um, there would very often be committed to um, Marxism and its uh, various manifestations as an, an ideal. But at the same time, they happily ignored an anomaly. Uh, most of them would either be born into uh, a position of privilege or they would have attained it themselves because they were doing well at whatever their pro- career involved, whether it was in the media or writing or the theatre or filmmaking or whatever. The anomaly that they happily and absurdly ignored was that if capitalism was replaced by socialism, their agreeable lifestyle would come to an end almost immediately. So they turn they turn their eyes away from that. I mean, it's, it's hilarious. I know it is. It is. Um, so let's talk about that first book. So we mentioned the Naked and the Dead. So that's completed in 1947. You tell the story that it ran to 900 pages. It took nine months to get into print. It was just reissued. I think this month by the Library of America. Yeah, put him on the map. Uh, skyrockets him to fame as the cliche goes. Tell the story about the reception of the reception of that book and like what it did for Mailer and his reputation. Well, I mean, uh, apart from the reception, it, it's it again. There, there's a lot of debate still on um, the most important novels of World War Two, or the most important novels immediately following World War Two, which almost inevitably meant that they were written by people who in some way experienced the conflict. And it is one of the best World War II novels. And I think it's good because um, it epitomizes um, a form of documentary realism that's quite rare for war novels. Um, and he did this, he, he achieved this in two ways. Um, he met many of the his his fellow servicemen, the the ones he met when he was going out to Pacific and when he served there as well. Many of them were interviewed later once he'd attained a you know, enormous degree of fame and about the novel in particular. And they said they could never work out why he would continuously want to talk to people, not just about uh, trivial events or sex or whatever, but he'd sit there talking to them, incessantly listening and making notes as well. What he was doing was 
without a tape recorder, recording accents and idioms and the way that people presented themselves as, as, as in, in the way that they spoke and the way that they um, used language as a form of persona, their, their persona and so on and so on. And, the, and, and these notebooks were part of the novel. The second aspect were the letters he wrote to his first wife, Meg. And she kept them all because it's assumed, although we have no absolute record of this, that he asked her to. And when he got back, she, she, she didn't co-write the novel, but she helped him with it in practical terms. They drew, they drew enormous diagrams and he was using, I mean, with, with some parts of the letters, you can see not quite verbatim shifts, but you can see how um, he was using, uh, say, the, the, the scenes of the mountains where he was travelling across the states to the west coast and the sea and uh, the, you know, the islands in the Pacific. These were immediate impressions. And when he got back to the states, he was using these as uh, raw material for the novels. So it was brilliant documentary realism. And I think the reception... Uh, to the novel, you know, it was celebrated because of that. And it got what it deserved. It was a, it, it was and is a great book. I think it's probably yeah. his best book, to be honest. Really? Okay. Yeah. Well, it's, um, it's best, his best piece of pure fiction anyway. Sure, sure. So going through his career, you talk about uh, I ask you, this idea about him being an, an insider and an outsider and how he loved these roles he played. I want to ask you about another one. Um, he was involved with his friend, Jean Malacroix. They were hired by Samuel Goldwyn of Metro Goldwyn Meyer to co-author a screenplay of Nathaniel West's Miss Lonely Hearts. And Miller kept getting, you tell us, bogged down by turning the film into a, go- uh, a sermon. And that Goldwyn said to him, and one of his Goldwynisms, I love this, quote, Miller, please stop this professional writer shit and start writing. Now, that's a great Goldwynism, right? But it taps into the way Miller lived. Like, he loved this professional writer shit, right? Like, how did he see his role as a writer, or especially as, like, an American 20th century writer? Well, um, it, the, the, the period he spent in Hollywood, I mean, I'm not great digressing here because I think it, it, it's, it's relevant to your question. <laughs> uh, it, it is... The, the deer park, in many ways, was a degree of sermonizing because it's, it's a very moral take on uh, corruption and sexual exploitation in Hollywood, so on and so on. But in truth, he actually enjoyed it quite a lot. <laughs> so, in a way, he was, he was alienating himself from something he, 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 you know, he did quite like. I mean, there's an uh, anecdote about um, how, he, the, you know, he, he given, they were given in the studio an office and a room next door to it with a bed. And they couldn't work out what it was for. And it was for use by their secretaries and them. Because they, they they were asked what sort of what nationality of secretary and what hairstyle of secretary they wanted, and it only became apparent to them that they weren't secretaries at all. Well, they might be able to do the typing, but they would provide other services at the same time. And I think a much better novel could have been written that was horribly comic about this, but he chose not to. But back to your question, um, his role as a professional writer. <laughs> Well, despite pretending to be appalled by uh, the sexual exploitation, corruption and conspicuous consumption of Hollywood, he loved the place. And in many ways, yeah. he wanted to remain part of it uh, while li- with living mostly from his writing. So in a way, he could see how his career as a writer, uh, if he continued to be successful, uh, would be similar to that who succeeded in Hollywood. And that's the way he continued to live. Although he yeah. didn't admit it, or rarely admitted it anyway. Right. It was. It's funny because the one portrait of, of, of Mailer in the book is that it's the opposite of, say, like the withdrawn artist who works in a garret and just wants to be heard by a few. Like he was, he was like a brass band. <laughs> <laughs> Quite, yes, absolutely. <laughs> 
Um, so let's talk about, you talked about the, the secretaries. This leads me on to my next question. So we go through, you go through his six wives, right? It's like shades of Henry VIII or something. Yes. And, and you, you, you go through this whole story and I couldn't help but think of the famous line by Samuel Johnson, you know, who once described second marriages as the triumph of hope over experience. So this is just a, I don't know if you can answer this cause it's a, it's, it goes into his psyche, but why did Mailer feel the, feel the need to keep marrying? Like, why not be this unmarried Lothario? He kept doing it. You'd think by, you know, the fifth time, he'd be like, all right, maybe, maybe I'm not the marrying type, but he kept going and going and going. I know. Well, um, I, I was, I, I've been, in my head, I've been trying to do a bit of basic arithmetic, but I've come to a rough account. And after, um, he was first married until his death. Uh, he was only unmarried for about a month. Wow. <laughs> really, I'd say just about a month. As soon as uh, each marital relationship ended, uh, practically always in disaster, he, was, he, <laughs> he almost always married again as rapidly as possible. I mean, it was... It was it was very. It was nearly always the case that the person he would marry before the previous marriage had ended, he would be having an affair with. Right. But he didn't hang around. I mean, there was no courtship involved. He'd married them as soon as he could, as soon as the divorce was ended. So he was he was married, in a way. He 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 was he was a sort of schizophrenic monogamist, and uh, he he stayed married for all of his life, but to different people, if you see what I mean. Yes. Um, yeah. And at the same time, he was still having a double life, even though he was the, as I put it, schizophrenic monogamous, monogamist, he was persistently and continuously having affairs with other people, almost from the beginning of every new marriage, he started having an affair with somebody else. Yeah. Um, it, it's... And there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's something curious about this. The one woman he remained faithful to, insofar as his love for her was unswerving, and he never deliberately caused her distress, was his mother. Right. And I, you know, I don't like amateur um, psychoanalysis, but Freud might have been right there. You never know. <laughs> Yeah, she doted on him too, according to your oh, book. God, yeah, I mean, you yeah. Know, when <laughs> when he finally won the or when he won the Pulitzer Prize um, for uh, Armies of the Night, there's that <laughs> wonderful quote where she's saying, "Why didn't he get it before?" Obviously, somebody's <laughs> conspiring against him. He should have the Nobel Prize, and you could almost hear the sort of New York Jewish accent coming through here. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. It's funny because when you talk about Harlot's ghost at the end of the book, you, you you say that he was in love with this idea of seduction. Like he loved he loved all of these you know double and secret agents of his heart, so to speak. Yeah, um, he yes, you're right. He, he he loved the thrill of trying to keep sex or his uh, sexual infidelities secret. Hence, uh, he enjoyed uh, what he called the research uh, regarding spy writing for Harlot's Ghost. But the irony there was that while he was doing the research for Harlot's Ghost, um, he was also using that time away from Norris, his final wife, to have an affair as well. <laughs> right. <laughs> his problem was that uh, although he was slightly uh, obsessed and fantasised about the CIA, he was utterly incompetent at, shall we call it, sexual espionage. Um, he always got found out. Yeah, he was always caught. Yeah. <laughs> you would think by, I, I laughed at myself as I read your book, like after, after you know, however many times it is, you think like, he never got any better at this. No. Like he never became a true CIA operative. Yeah, and it be, because he, he, never, he never found it easy to keep anything secret. Not that he gave it away deliberately. Right. He's just so careless. Yes. Careless is the perfect word for it. That's perfect, right? 
So let's move on to some of his, his, if we can do this, this might be even tougher than trying to pin him down psychologically, but let's try to pin him down like politically and culturally, right? If you, if someone asked you like, what are two or three of his like core ideas or, or the ideas that Norman Mailer brought to the American scene in his career, like what, what would you say some of them were, the big ones? <laughs> oh dear. To be honest, Tough question. I don't- you, I suppose you could try to pick some, if, if you wanted to select some in terms of quotations and then summarise them, you could do that. But you'd be telling lies, really. I don't, I don't think, um, in truth, he had any ideas that were um, sincere and coherent. He used ideas in all sorts of ways. I mean, the, 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 the white Negro was an unintended uh, black comedy in many ways. Because it was a, it was a collection of uh, idiocies. Um, I I don't I have no idea what um, ideologies he thought he was invoking in this. If you could if you could, I, I suppose if you were being um, charitable, you might call him a uh, a careless anarchist. In the sense that. I've always been puzzled by anarchy uh, in that it's supposed to be a sort of uh, coherent political ideology, but it always, to me, invokes, uh, I don't know, laziness. You know, I don't don't really care about political organisation. I just, you know, rather not bother, really. And the white Negro and many other of his ideas, he'd he'd pick up things which he knew would be shocking uh, and he'd throw them into the mix. That they might, the, the fact that they might contradict other aspects of his supposed ideological position didn't seem to matter to him. I mean, there was a, yeah. there was a terrible um, anecdote in The White Negro where the, he has the two thugs or the two young Latinos, they're supposed to be, who shoot the shopkeeper. And he seems to. Um, eulogize them in a way um you know these are the heroes of the new america and you can think but what about the shopkeeper you know he had a family for god's sake but because right. they, 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 they they are uh, in in some ways in some ways sort of existential uh anarchic heroes they deserve more attention and the family left behind by the shock. It was all completely bonkers. I don't think he has a, had a political position that you could pin down at all. It was just him, the showman, basically. Yeah. You talk about him and giving a speech, and you say that um, you say that uh, he sounded like a, an undergraduate preparing a paper half an hour before the seminar. But that was a perfect simile. <laughs> yes, quite. I mean, that, that, it, it, that's um, exactly what I meant by. Um, he he was far more articulate than someone of that age, I suppose. But when, when you're trying to pin down what he was actually talking about, um, if yeah. you had a record of these things, you know, people there, there was there, there are accounts of when he gave some of his early speeches. Um, that, um, he, his 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 wife and friends of his were sort of turning to look at one another and. Uh, None of them could quite work out what was going on or what was going to happen next. Right. It was enormously entertaining, but slightly Which disturbing draw, at the same sure. time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about him being articulate because one of the things your book inspired me to do was I, I went down the YouTube rabbit hole and I watched many, many clips of, of Mailer. I, I watched him speaking. I watched his interviews. And I, I want to ask you about, in, in 1962, you talk about how he debated William F. Buckley in front of this sellout crowd of 3,600 yeah. people, which is great. I mean, you can go back, and I've watched the episodes on Firing Line between, with Buckley and Mailer, and the two of them are really, really great together. <clears throat> now, we know from other sources that, like, Buckley and Mailer actually did get – they should be a snake and a mongoose, but they got along very well – outside of their each of their uh, yeah. respective sticks you could say right so do you think that that kind of like thing has vanished from like public intellectual life like this idea like you have mailer debating you know buckley and those kinds of figures you think that's kind of gone uh yeah there's two aspects of that i i, I think it has gone um 
uh, both in the US and in Britain and in most parts of continental Europe as well. Um, probably, and again, I'm going to sound slightly pompous here, mainly because the general public's attention span and general interest in ideas have both diminished considerably since 1962 because of the way that um, the media and social media have gradually eaten into our uh, sense of wanting to listen to things and continue to or maintain um, an interest in things that might involve a challenge that's going to last more than about two or three minutes. So, yeah, that has diminished. As you say, you know, 3,600 people who would turn up for something like that and stay interested in it. And also, you know, they, they weren't. He and Buckley, as you point out, were quite good friends. And they weren't performing when they went up against each other in a sort of right. verbal boxing match. Um, they did hold different ideas. But at the same time, they could be um, comfortable with themselves while being opponents on the stage. And that sort of thing has disappeared largely yeah. both in yeah, politics it. and and in the and in the in, in in the world of culture and literature as well yeah, I, I 100% agree. And I love what you said about that because because when you watch those clips of Firing Line, it's really just two people in two chairs. There's no flash. There's there's zero flash. It's literally just two people talking about ideas yeah. for an hour. Yeah, you, you won't find that on um, television and certainly not um, live on stage now at all. It's, it, yeah. it has uh, – it, it, it doesn't exist anymore. Right, right. So he got along well with Buckley, but not with Gore Vidal. And he was another great 20th century figure, another character, so to speak, from this pantheon that we have to talk about. So you tell the story. and Everyone who's listening can see this on YouTube. Talk about what happened when they were booked on the Dick Cavett show in 1971. Well, the the, um, uh, the argument, if you want to put it in that way, between... um, (laughs) Gore Vidal and Mailer, uh, I suppose, began when they first met towards the end of the 50s, when they were both uh, making a name in literature. Um, and it was clear that uh, even at that point, Mailer in many ways <laughs> resented uh, Vidal, probably because he thought that he was part of the... He was born into the... Um, uh, the American social aristocracy, and he had become part of the cultural and literary aristocracy. And Mailer felt that, you know, why not me? Um, but at the Cabot show, uh, as usual, Mailer um, had had several substances, had taken several substances and drank a lot of stuff as well. And there's a subtext that the audience didn't appreciate because at one point he accused um, Vidal of, he said, you, you murdered Jack Kerouac. And the audience was sort of puzzled and staring at one another because two years earlier they knew that Kerouac um, had almost certainly drunk himself to death. He had several serious medical conditions, but he effectively bled, bled to death because his liver was in a mess. And you say, you know, how could he have murdered Jack Kerouac? But the the, the subtext of this was that um, around 10, 11 years before, um, when Mailer and um, Vidal were knocking around in the same literary circles, Mailer was driving him back from a party in Trump province town and in his uh, typically insouciant manner, Vidal um, said when they were talking about Ker- Kerouac, and so I said, I "said Oh yes, I, I can't I can't quote it verbatim because there's no record of it. Something like I slept with him at the weekend, and Mailer almost crashed the car because apart from anything else, he thought homosexuality was a disease, and throughout the decade afterwards." <laughs> <laughs> he privately br- blamed Vidal for turning K- 
Kerouac into an alcoholic and ruining his career because in many ways he'd infected him with homosexuality. And that's what led to this bus stop. It, it, it was, it was uh, preposterous, ridiculous, hideous in many yeah. ways, but horribly black comic as well. But and he slapped a Vidal of, uh, to, before yeah. they went on stage, yeah, right? In the great room. It wasn't the only time as well. He, he, yes. he, pushed, him, he, he pushed him over a table of... Uh, of um, uh, well, he was loaded with food and drink at a, at a, a literary launch at some point as well. <laughs> and uh, Vidal was getting used to this. In 2002, it was quite charming, really. They made up. Um, yes. The, in Provincetown... Um, at the Repertory Theatre, Mailer and his wife, uh, his final wife, Norris, decided to do a performance of Don Juan in Hell. Um, and he wrote to uh, Vidal saying, would you like to fly over and play the devil? And Vidal thought he was joking. He thought this was a sick <laughs> joke. He said, no, 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 not at all. And Vidal, to his credit, even though he's at that time, you know, he was almost the same age, he was occasionally using a Zimmer frame. He flew over. And there was this performance with um, Mailer, the debaucher, Norris, uh, his occasional paramour as uh, Donna Anna, and um, Vidal as uh, the devil. And they, the, the the audience packed the place every night, you know, because the, these figures from uh, literary yeah. legend of the past 50 years were having such a good time playing out this yeah. uh, slightly um, ridiculous drama, but having a good time of it as well. So in the end, it all, it all, you know, ended happily, I suppose. Yeah, the drama off stage and on. I, I also have to—I uh, have to tell the listeners the story. I love how you say when when um, Norman Mailer threw Vidal over the table that Vidal actually got the bet. He got the last laugh because he said, "Once again, Norman, I see words fail you." <laughs> <laughs> <Quite>. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so from Gore Vidal to JFK. So. Mailer had a great enthusiasm for JFK. You say that Mailer thought JFK was going to be America's savior, yeah. <clears throat> that Mailer imagined himself becoming this Arthur Schlesinger Jr.-like figure to advise the president. And JFK had a meeting with him. He was briefed on what Mailer's books were about, but that after JFK won, that's it. He cut the ties. And I and you know, JFK, he did the same thing with Sinatra. Sinatra thought he'd become part of that inner circle. And JFK gets elected, and it's like, okay, we're cutting ties with Sinatra too. So do you think that Mailer was just kryptonite? Like JFK was like, I can't have this guy around me. Or was that part of, you know, that was also seems to be Mailer's idea of himself, like uh, advisor to the president. Can you talk about his relationship with JFK? Yeah. Well, when, when, when Mailer was first uh, invited to the um, Kennedy house, when uh, he was running for the presidency, uh, you know, he was, he was flattered and fascinated but apparently what happened was that that there'd, there'd been a the the the, the, De, the democrats had used this representation of um sorry my mind's gone blank his 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 who else was a, a standing for the president at the same time oh uh what nixon or humphrey or Wait. against against um kennedy in his first yeah it was it was nixon Nixon, yeah, uh, he, right. they, they presented Nixon as a slightly swarthy car salesman, right? Um, and the Republicans, in many ways, to their credit, came back with this with this story of say, you know, he might sell you slightly wonky cars, but what JFK will do is sell you the car, come round to make sure it's serviced, then pop round the day after and have sex with your wife. Um, <laughs> The, the 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 Kennedy crew were getting a bit disturbed with this because they thought actually this is true because no one outside the circle knew that JFK was a serial philanderer but they were a bit disturbed because they thought well they wondered if the Republicans knew this and would they begin to start releasing quietly pieces of information to the press 
So the real reason that Mailer was brought in as was potentially as a source, how much did, uh, you know, the media know about what JFK was like? So once he'd satisfied himself from Mailer that they didn't really know, know very much at all, he was booted out. But at the same time, he saw things very differently. He thought he was being recruited to the court as a special right. advisor. But no, once once that slight uh, moment of doubt was settled, they didn't want anything more to do with him. But he continued to write bizarre letters to them, offering advice on you know uh, the problems in the South and Cuba and God knows what, and they never, ever wrote back. It was, again, it was part of the bizarre comedy of his life. Yeah, JFK they, took they, out they, his 10-foot pole. They, they must, um, you know, there's, there's, we no, have no record of what they actually said, but they must have thought, how can we get rid of this nutcase who continues to write us letters about how he can help us? So <clears throat> JFK's elected... JFK is assassinated. We move on to Johnson. Let's talk now about, about something, you know, we've, we've beat up on Mailer a lot, something he does really well. In 1968, he gets his first Pulitzer for Armies of the Night, and that's yes. his book about the 1967 anti-Vietnam protests. Now, this one you like. You, you, you like this book a lot. You say that the book works because it allows Mailer to, quote, embed his sometimes deranged prophecies of the previous 15 years with a portrait of America that seemed authentic. So... You know, how does this book epitomize what you think Mailer does well as a writer? Well, I, I think the, the the key to its success is in its subtitle, which is, um, you know, as, as you know from the cover, history as a novel, the novel as history. Because after Mailer, I think, realized that his uh, career as a pure fiction writer was going to be limited. Um, he turned instead to this half-breed form of uh, never pure fiction, never pure non-fiction. And The Armies of the Night was his best version of that blend. Um, and Because although he, he didn't change any uh, facts about what happened or as he saw it happening... And as it, as things were reported to him during the protests at the Pentagon and so on and so on, what he did was to tell it as though it were a novel. So in many ways, it's true. And in other ways, it's a version of the truth. And that's what he did quite... He, he's, he's, he's juggling, basically. He's mm -hmm. keeping balls in the air persistently, continuously. You know these things actually happened. And you know that Norman Mailer is there because he's a character in his own novel. But at the same time, you're never quite sure about how the nuances and the presentation shift things slightly towards the way he wants you to see it uh, rather than towards a purely documentary account of what actually happened. So I think it's, it, it is very good in that sense. Yeah, you wonder about the tension between the mailer in the book and the mailer who wrote it. Yeah, quite. <laughs> um, I wholly enjoyed the part of your book. This might have been my favorite part of the book where you talk about his second run in 1969 for mayor of New York City with Jimmy Breslin as his running mate. Yeah. And I knew this this happened vaguely, but reading your book filled in all the gaps I had. And it was this part was just terrific, right? So you tell the story of how Jimmy Breslin, who was this great, you know, roll up your sleeves, you know, rough and tumble New York reporter, um, he kept quitting or threatening to quit over yeah. what you called the deranged element of Mailer's proposal. So Mailer bursts on the scene. Now, it's funny, you just reminded me that Buckley also ran for mayor of New York City and, and also didn't work. But so Mailer would give these press conferences and have all of these crazy proposals about what was going to happen if he were mayor of New York City. What were some of these proposals? And, and, and tell the story of how he did as a candidate. Yeah, I mean, and, and you say his, his, his partner was sometimes have his head in his hands. He couldn't believe what he'd taken on here because um, Mailer's uh, various aspects of his manifesto were sort of planned um, logically in advance, but he keep adding to them as the, as the campaign went on. And his his team was the... Uh, 
variously frustrated and going insane by what he'd say next. I mean, some of the, the less controversial, he decided that New York City would be made up of little districts which should have a certain amount of autonomy. And he said to make sure that, um, you know, that there was no, of the, instead of the old um, differences in terms of ethnicity or gang warfare or, warfare or anything like that, of the old days of the metropolis, there would be stickball competitions, which would be a, a sort of a, a friendly version of baseball where the each area would play each other at stickball and, you know, there'll be reconciliations all over the metropolis. Um, <laughs> uh, there'd be free loan of bicycles for all commuters because they, he was trying to cut down on cars because of pollution and because of the, you know, the danger pedestrians. And he would allow people to exercise continually, continuously in Central Park. There would be no charge for um, day centres and nurseries. And there'd be farmers markets that would be exclusively devoted to produce um, by farmers from the periphery of the city that would be brought in, you know, he, he imagined it sometimes with horses and carts and so on. And you think, this is bizarre. It was rather like the green city of the present day. But, right. you know, you, you, you shouldn't get carried away by this image because there was a degree, of, a degree of manic, weird hedonism involved as well because he wanted legalised casinos um, where gam- gambling uh, would be encouraged rather than people wasting their money on other things. Um, and there would be an annual Grand Prix uh, in Central Park, not with sort of Formula One cars, but with the most expensive sports cars in the world. So people could sit around and admire these things crashing and their owners dying if necessary. Um, drug, drug Drug addicts would get free methadone and they'd be given this by usually policemen who'd hand it out to them so again this would control crime and policemen would be encouraged to take up uh, or live in apartments in some of the most crime-ridden areas of the city and he seriously expected the police to put up with this and of course he also he also uh, would excuse um Every person in the city, military service, without facing the problem of how he was going to get round this with Washington. And the most famous, of course, was his version of Sweet Sundays. Every month there'd be a Sweet Sunday where there'd be no traffic, no aeroplanes, all electricity would be turned off, and people would just sit around contemplating the niceness of everything. (laughs) <laughs> and you know, he'd, at various points, he he'd be um, he'd be quizzed on this. You know, people were rather puzzled, and they'd say, "But what about winter? You know, what if it snows two feet of snow? And yeah, you know, how, how 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 do I get down the street?" And famously, he just sort of sit sit there staring at the, the floor. And people would say, "I I need to you know take my grandmother down to the shop, and I can't get through with the snow. How?" How can I get there without a snowplow? I'd piss on it. Right, I'd piss on it, right. And people say, but what about hospitals? You know, hospitals need electricity to keep um, various things going to keep people alive. And what about, you know, these sweet Sundays where people are dying in hospitals? Well, impeach me. Yeah, that's the answer. Yeah. And at these, at these points, at this point, members of his team were having a nervous breakdown. Right. But it, it was because it, Jimmy Breslin. Yeah, I was going to say Jimmy, Jimmy Breslin, Breslin really did believe these things. Like Jimmy Breslin <laughs> did. He he really thought he was in for a real campaign. Yeah. And it it, it, it was a, it was a it was a, a, a bizarre version of his half digested notions of. Um, anarcho-Marxism and the sort of life that he enjoyed himself that he'd offer to everyone else without <laughs> really having to work for it. Right. Yeah. Everyone, a whole city of Norman Mailers. Yeah. <laughs> 
So let's move ahead. So, and of course, you know, you talk about how he did in the polls. Like he came in, like yeah. I think fifth, or yeah, he, 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 I think he, I think he came fifth with a, a considerable vote, though. But, <laughs> um, you know, so some of the other um, can uh, there were there were several people who stood who were leftish, leftish, I suppose, and who never forgave him because he he right. denied them. What they thought was their share of the boat, because there were serious politicians, and you know, people ugh, mad enough to believe that Mailer could do this voted for him, and they deprived right. them of the boat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's over, and then we move on to 1979. We move on to the Executioner song that got him his second Pulitzer. Now, just to review the story for our listeners, if they don't know, you know, Gary Gilmore committed two murders in cold blood during two robberies in 1976. He was executed in 1977 after a 10-year period of no executions in the United yeah. States. And this seems to be the one book that even Mailer's enemies don't begrudge him. Like, like I've met a lot of people who say, oh, Norman Mailer, he's blah, blah, blah. But The Executioner's Song, that's a terrific book. Now, you acknowledge the power of that book, but you have this caveat in there. And I thought this was really interesting. Here's what you say about the book. You say, Mailer played a game of smoke and mirrors he did not quite alter the facts of Gilmore's life, crimes, and eventual fate, but turned them into a spare existential artwork and therefore embargoed the question of whether Gilmore was just a small-minded narcissist who killed people because he felt like it. So you, I love that. You say he embargoed the question. So you have this 1,100-page book that's going to be this you know, piercing look into the soul of America. But the key question you say Mailer kind of he sidesteps and he embargoes it, right? Can you talk about that? Yeah. Um, again, it's you, you can see that he's um, doing something not dissimilar to um, the armies of the night, where sure. he um, <clears throat> does a great deal of pretty exemplary research into um, the background to... Um, Gilmore himself, even before the murders, the murders themselves, the trial, the uh, events running up to his eventual execution by firing squad and so on and so on. Uh, nothing or hardly anything is distorted in terms of uh, factual uh, reportage. But again, there's this aspect of Gilmore and people he knew who again, uh, who, 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 who at the same time are based on real individuals, uh, who are turned into um, exemplars of some sort of, uh, as I say, an eg existential tragedy artwork, if you like. And while we wonder always about the nature of Gary, Gary Gilmore because we follow the story of Gary Gilmore to his execution. What he notably ignores, um, perhaps because he has to, is how the people of the two, uh, the, the families of the two people he killed feel about this. In many ways, he, he, it would have been po impossible for him to write the novel had he even speculated on the effects of Gilmore's act without actually going into Gilmore's mindset when he committed these crimes. Had he speculated on uh, the effect of those families, it would have ruined the novel. So I think that that's really behind my um, claim or caveat, as you point, point out, that um, he embargoes the true nature of Gary Gilmore. If he'd said something or speculated even on the effect of what happened, both of the people who probably had, who knows, five minutes before the bullet went through their brains to die, or the people who had to view the bodies and then bury them. No, he couldn't touch that at all. I mean, I, I'm I, I'm I'm anti-capital punishment completely, but I, I I think there's something slightly unsettling about turning murder and capital punishment, where uh, 
it is part of the judicial system into what is, to be blunt, the form of entertainment. Yeah. Although I, 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 so I, I know it, it, it seems to diminish the quality of the book to say that. And it is a good book, but I feel very uneasy about it personally. Yes, that unease is a is a great way to put it because you you wonder as you read the book. I mean, I've I've read it again maybe five or six years ago. You wonder like is does Mailer want Gary Gilmore to be like Marceau in The Stranger, where he's this existential you know hero, or, or is yeah. he is he something else? And you can't quite oh, pin him down, and that makes yeah, you very he, uneasy. He, as a he certainly doesn't romanticize him as a right. hero in inverted commas. Right. But at the same time, he deliberately avoids other questions right. and other, shall we say, emotional issues that surround what he did, right. which inevitably he, ha- he had to in order to write the book as it stands. Yeah. Which makes and his it, defense of, I was going to say, his defense of that. It, as, as I say, a, a slightly disturbing piece of work. Yeah. But would Mailer's defense, you think, be, I left all that stuff out because I wanted I wanted you to take this story in and think about it? Do you think that's a fair defense of Mailer? Uh, well, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that if, if, if you're going to – because there are certain parts of it where it's not focused exclusively on Gilmore. He talks about how he, he thinks inside himself into the brain of Gilmore's girlfriend. And sure. you see the world as she saw it when she's driving a car at some point and so on and so on. And if you're going to do that, if you're going to write it as though it were a novel, a technique he was perfected with um, real-life events before, and particularly in the armies of the night, which parts do you keep in and which parts do you completely exclude? And you right. begin to wonder about, as well as being aware of, which parts he knew he was going to exclude. Particularly, yeah, but... what's it like being shot by Gary Gilmore? Not what does Gary Gilmore feel as he's being shot, or what are the situation? What is the situation like as he's you know strapped to the chair and being shot? Okay, yeah. um, it's uh, depending. Irrespective of your opinions on capital punishment, I find the whole concept of capital punishment quite appalling myself. But to concentrate on that and to entirely exclude what it's like being shot by Gary Gilmore uh, because it wouldn't have extinguished them in a millisecond, it would have taken longer than that, and the longer-term effects on the friends and family of those people who've been shot by Gary Gilmore, and so on and so on. Yeah, you've got to be no, that's, that's... cruelly selective, I think, in writing yeah. something like that. Right. Yeah, and it's funny because the length of the book is a cinder block. So if certainly, it wasn't it wasn't any constraints of space that had Mailer keep those things out. Oh no, of course not. <laughs> Anything <laughs> but. <laughs> that never bothered him before. Um, now, after Gary Gilmore, it's it's interesting you're talking about this whole idea about like the theory of the novel and what you include. But then after the Executioner's Song, Mailer actually starts to apply some of his ideas. You said before he used ideas. And when he intersected with another killer, so who was Jack Henry Abbott and, and how did he enter Mailer's story? Well, Jack Henry Abbott, um, I suppose purely by coincidence, is... Uh, I suppose another version of Gary Gilmore. Okay, you can say that there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of versions of Gary Gilmore with reg- who, with regard maybe to their background, um, have spent a lot of time mixing with the criminal fraternity or have spent a lot of their adult or juvenile adult life in jail. Uh, Jack Henry Abbott wrote a letter to Gilmore, uh, wrote a letter to Mailer and explained his situation to him. And he wasn't asking for pity and he wasn't asking uh, Mailer simply to try and get him out of jail. What he was doing was um, talking to him as an equal because he, he seemed to suggest that in writing about Gilmore, uh, Mailer 
had written about the sort of people that he, Abbott, was too. And Mailer was fascinated because, and I think uh, Mailer was fascinated, and I think this, this tells us a lot about what he was doing when he wrote the Executioner's Song. Because when he read Abbott's first letter and then other letters, he began to see something in them of what he had invented, in inverted commas, when he recreated Gary Gilmore. And OK, you don't, we don't really know what Gary Mil- Gilmore was like, but we know uh, what Mailer's Gary Gilmore was like. He didn't romanticise him, but he made him something far more uh, fascinating than the real Gary, Gary Gilmore, whatever the real Gary Gilmore was like. And suddenly, when he started reading this first-person account by Abbott, it, it must have felt to him that, well, yes, this justified what, what I did with Gilmore. Because despite the fact that Abbott was... Uh, as, as I said, spent v- mo- most of his adult life in prison, was a murderer. He wrote really well, and he wrote, he wrote in a way that you would expect Gilmore to write had he been uh, describing his life and writing the executioner's song in the first person, which is what fascinated Mailer. And Mailer did help him uh, to get out of prison because he said that, you know, he in some way reinvented himself as a person with literary talent. And that basically was the premise. And the parole board uh, went along with it. And he his book was published and he was released from prison straight into the arms of the um, literary community and the you know the, the the book was getting fantastic reviews during the first two weeks of his release, and uh, Mailer met him when he arrived in New York, uh, and within about seven or eight days, he murdered a waiter and went on the run, and it, it was quite bizarre. He was getting he was getting fantastic reviews while the police were looking for him. So it was almost as though Gary Gilmore had walked out of his novel and become someone who was no longer in prison, Mm -hmm. but on the run. It was quite a a bizarre, actual uh, mixture of fiction and fact, except fact was taking over from fiction. Rather Rather than the two of them being... Um, blended or controlled by the writer. Abbott was, for Mailer, rather like someone that he wanted to use or wanted to recreate, as he had with Gilmore. And that's why he was so fascinated by him. But he he found that he couldn't control or manipulate what was actually going to happen. And Abbott turned out to be a real murderer, who committed a real murder, even after he'd written a book about who he was. A very fascinating, well-written piece of work. It's a quite the most bizarre story. The whole story reminds me of what you said about the about the sweet Sundays in the snow, right? So we have this idea, <clears throat> there'll be no, no power. What if it snows? Well, I'll, I'll piss on it, you know? That yeah. he has this idea because you say that after that Miller went uh, to the parole board, I think it was, and said, I'm willing to gamble with certain elements of society to save this man's talent. Yeah. And, and then someone's yeah, going, well, that's, after, that, that's after he's committed the crime after yeah. he's written the book, yeah. And, and you say, well, well, one more victim is good for future masterpieces. And you also yeah. point out like another, like, it seems like it's, Mailer would make these ideas that you can deflate within three seconds because you point out that the waiter that Abbott killed was also an artist. He was a dancer, wasn't he? Or was, yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. right. So that kind of art is different. Like, you know, it, it, it takes, you know, three seconds to find a contradiction or a hole in Mailer's argument. But by then he was already onto something else. And in, in many ways, um, I mean, the, the, the point I made earlier, the stuff that all the material that Mailer uh, was obliged to leave out of the executioner's song because it would have 
in, in many ways have ruined his methodology to have included it. Right. It's almost as though that um, aesthetic took revenge on him with Abbott because it came back to him with and uh, took control of what he thought was, you know, a project that could have been one that he'd invented, but which took which took on a life of its own, if you like, yeah. if you see what I mean. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's an interest. The revenge of the aesthetic. That's a that's a terrific way to put it. So, Mailer continues writing. He dies in two thousand seven at the age of eighty four. Right, so it's sixteen years later now. What do you see as the legacy of Norman Mailer? Why do you think people still read him, and why should they? Well, I think, I, I think, I think, um, so some of some of his books are will endure as really important um, pieces of fiction and non-fiction and. Um, hybrids, basically, and I I have my doubts about many of them, but that's why I think they will endure because people will continually argue over them for years to come. You can say that with some authors, they're um, fixed in the canon, if you want to put it that way, as classics, and in many ways it deadens them when they're like that. You can celebrate them and you can admire how the achievement uh, came to be in this particular period. And eventually this becomes so boring that you just want to stop listening to it and contributing to it. But the point about Mailer, and this I think will ensure his legacy, is that he will never be boring, either as an individual or as a writer who never... Uh, achieved a spectacular sense of creating a faultless classic. The fact that none of his work is faultless means that it will endure because you will end up arguing about, continually arguing about, why didn't he do that? Why on earth did he do that? (laughs) What went wrong with that? Or why is that so brilliant? And why did it go downhill afterwards? And why on earth did he write something as completely mad as the white Negro? It's always right. why and how. Um, there are very few writers like that. I think I think his uh, bizarre. I mean, the, the the first questions you ask, you know, why did he become an outsider? The fact that he become an outsider became an outsider. He was the person who wouldn't refuse to be categorised, and he stayed like that in the way he behaved with women, in the way he behaved with other people, the, the way he started fights, the way he was persistently drunk and bizarre and all the rest of it, that was reflected in his writing. So we'll never be able to make up our minds about the real nature of Mailer's writing because it reflects the way he was. That's why there will be a legacy of Norman Mailer. Yeah, that's great. I love how you said it. It, 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 it challenges the notion of a stable classic piece of literature. Yeah, he certainly challenges stability, right? I love it because in the yeah. book you point out, because <clears throat> I'm with you that I remember reading Ancient Evenings years ago or trying to finish it. I couldn't get through it. But then Harold Bloom does the review you quote, and he says it's one of the greatest novels of the 20th century. And I've met other people who have said, no, that's his best book. And I'm like, what do you mean that's his best? That's like one of his worst books. And 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 that's, that's part of his legacy, right, is that people will still argue <laughs> about yeah, uh, these extremes. Is- you know, he, he was the only person to win the Literary Review Bad Sex Award posthumously. Right. <laughs> because he, he, even though he died be, before the the jury came out, they said, well, you know, is it tasteless to give him the Bad Sex Award because he died three months ago? And they thought, no, this is the best piece of bad sex ever written. I mean, it takes some effort to achieve that, I think. It does. A whole career. <laughs> so... <laughs> Richard, it has been absolutely great talking with you today. I I urge all of our listeners to get a copy of Tough Guy, The Life of Norman Mailer. You can get it wherever books are sold. Like I said to you when we started, Richard, I I enjoyed every page of this. It reawakened my interest in Mailer and and in in his his zaniness and in in his flaws and in his his artistic triumphs. Like we talked about The Naked and the Dead just being republished by the Library of America. So it's very timely. So thank you so much for coming on the show today. 
Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. I've enjoyed it.